explain the Silicon Valley Ethereum meetup, I was actually really excited to come back here because last year um, I gave a talk at one and it was one of the most fun talks I've given because uh, we got to go down in detail into a bunch of areas uh, of where the future of computing might go with these kinds of uh, systems. So I figured I would cover at the very beginning kind of like the light, um, what's going on now, what IPFS is about, what Filecoin is about, um, what, how it's going to work with um, other systems and so on. And then I would dive into zooming out a bit and looking at the general changes that are happening to computing, uh, talk about some problems that we need to fix as a community, uh, and talk about scalability and things like that. And in general, make a case for recruiting Silicon Valley uh, to join this effort in a huge way. Because one observation that I've been making is a lot of this innovation is not happening in Silicon Valley. And uh, there's a distinction between how Silicon Valley thinks and how uh, the blockchain world thinks. And there needs to be mu much more communication across those barriers. Uh, and there are, there are just huge scale differences when you think about how much information some of the huge Silicon Valley companies process. Um, and there are completely different models, right? Like this is a very different model of computation, completely different power dynamics, and so on. Uh, but I think it would be super valuable to have a lot more cross-pollination, particularly when it comes to products uh, and that people will use. Uh, because Silicon Valley is very good at building products that people use and, and UIs and awesome UX and so on. And I think that that's one of the major challenges for these distributed systems coming up. Uh, maybe, potentially maybe not next year. Ideally, hopefully we'll have very good applications next year. But the year after that, I think it will be definitively, if we don't get that right, then we may not change the world as much as we think we will. Um, and so we have this great opportunity right now to return the internet to its principles. Uh, we might as well do that. Uh, and it will require very strong focus on, on mobile. Uh, and that's something that I think a lot of us know is very important, but we haven't focused as deeply into. Uh, cool. So the talk, the decentralized web is the main thing that people are talking about these days. And a lot of these projects, Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin and a bunch of others kind of fall be behind this. Uh, but I also like to talk about the distributed web, which is fundamentally different. Um, and uh, that's more what we are aiming for. And I think a lot of people will agree. Uh, and it's just slightly different, right? So uh, I work at a company called Protocol Labs. We focus on designing protocols. And we really try to think of it as a lab of saying, um, let's take this amazing machine that we built, the internet, this like, nervous system that we're all connected to, and think through the stack of protocols that we built, think how to uh, evolve it, uh, question underli huge underlying assumptions like, should DNS really be around? Should DNS really point to IP addresses? Like That's such a huge assumption in every single application we use today. Um, maybe that shouldn't work, right? And this is the same kind of questioning that is happening in Ethereum and, and all that kind of stuff. And the way we think about things is that there's this pipeline of creating uh, superpowers, right? So software, when it reaches you as a human, as an application, is a superpower that you gain. And you gain this amazing ability to communicate or work or transact and so on. And there's a very simple pipeline of creating these things. And it starts with ideas and a bunch of brains talking to each other and sending messages and inspired by other knowledge around in papers. And some ideas are actually sound and good and you can test them and create proofs and so on and say, hey, I think we have something that can improve the network. You take that and you write specs of what this might actually uh, work like and so on. You produce code. All of this is actually quite cheap. You just need people thinking in a room and writing. Um, and then you start getting into a bit tougher problems of deploying it out to uh, millions or billions of computers uh, and then eventually getting humans to adopt it, which I think is the huge, biggest hurdle. Getting humans to use a thing. Uh, there are certain great advantages that if you nail those, you can get tons of humans using something. But to fundamentally change the entire architecture of the internet, uh, or the web, the internet is pretty good as, as is. There's some problems, but the web mostly is what, what needs to be vastly improved. Uh, you need to focus in extremely on adoption and thinking very carefully about how these applications will work. So this pipeline has these stages, and these stages, can you, OK, great. Uh, these stages, the way we see it, I mean, this is not at all accurate, but we see it as there's an enormous amount of research going on in academia. Um, 
is light years ahead in many ways. And I will also classify the blockchain development that is more industry as this kind of research as well. Uh, it's one of the things that I love about the Ethereum community. It's very focused on new ideas and generating new things. Um, or going back to old ideas and revisiting them and thinking about how to make them work these days. But these filters, there's, there's going from research to developing something that actually works to deploying into the network and getting humans to use it, there's these huge filters. And a lot of the times those filters are not based on you know, uh, whether something is a good idea or profitable, but rather something dumb happens like, oh, the implementation was in C and you really need it in the browser, or um, this, the idea was really good, but the protocol was actually broken or something. And those filters are super problematic. That's what prevents us from taking amazing ideas that have been around for decades and turning them into reality. When you look at IPFS and you dig into the ideas that make it up, they've been around for many decades, many of them, right? So frustrating. One thing that happened is Bitcoin uh, showed that you could bind a protocol to a store of value thing, and you could use that to fund the development of the thing itself because people were incented to grow the network. Ethereum took that and grew it well beyond that and said, hey, what if we just use this as a new funding model and we just allocate some amount of that uh, token to create this new, um, this new thing that everyone can be a part of. And this is, I think, one of the most important things happening in our community. Uh, this new way of protocols, not quite self-funding, but funding development and funding um, this massive amount of innovation is a great way to unlock innovation around the world. Um, and we'll see, I think, a lot more about this. And thing. Uh, Fred is going to talk about this. Uh, Pro Collapse is very focused on this kind of model. And we think that this is going to be the way that tons of applications and tons of protocols get built over the next few years. Uh, I usually have this slide because uh, this is a very, very old slide, Paul Barron's uh, classification of networks. This was the guy who, one of the people who invented packet switching. And he classified network, networks into centralized, decentralized, and distributed. Um, centralized networks, of course, big problem, center point of failure. Uh, decentralized networks, not quite fully distributed. A lot of people disagree with this classification, by the way. I'm going to make a caveat that a lot of people would swap names and so on. But I'm trying to make a point here, and that specific nuance point is that when you look at a decentralized network, um, when you're part of the network, yes, not one central node um, controls the network, but you still have one network that you're part of. And you get, if you get disconnected from that network, you can no longer operate. And blockchains today work that way. I'm extremely interested in pushing all of this back to the original principles of the internet of TCP IP into a, something that's fully distributed, where if you can cut the network in half, it doesn't matter. Maybe it loses capability to talk to everyone else, but it can still function. And blockchains today don't work that way. In fact, uh, I'm very excited that the Ethereum community is focused on this kind of thing and does think this way as well. Uh, but most people around the world don't think this way. In fact, the web entirely is centralized. Um, so it, there's some amount of decentralization, but when you really dig into how content is represented, content is identified by its location, which inherently centralizes everything into that one place, and content doesn't, um, content is not distributed. Uh, so IPFS is entirely about moving from the centralized model of the web to a fully distributed one. Uh, Blockchains, I think, have pushed the centralization of transactions into the decentralized realm, but we need to keep going and push it all the way into the distributed slot. And I think the, the ideas are already out there. People have come up with good ways of doing the completely distributed thing with transaction processing. It just needs to be deployed, and it just needs to, we need to show that it works, uh, and so on, right? And that's what's going to prevent blockchains from really, re not necessarily replacing, but uh, becoming the main transaction processing system of the internet, it's that if you're in a major city and you lose access and connectivity to the rest of the world, you don't want to just stop processing like that. Or, or you don't want to start mining on a different chain and suddenly like you, hours or days later, you join back to the network and all of your transactions are now invalid, right? Or you have to work on rebasing them. Like that's not a great failure model. And like I said, I thought a lot of people are thinking about this problem, which is great news. It's just we don't have it deployed yet. And so once we do, uh, I think these systems will be unstoppable. I want to highlight this. Uh, uh, totally wrecked, right? <laughs> totally wrecked. Um, 
this is pretty embarrassing. So uh, Emin Gruen tweeted, uh, you know, this is embarrassing. We need to like fix this. And absolutely right. Uh, it's so silly that this kind of failure uh, could happen. So again, we need to embed good crypto and good distributed systems and good uh, better models into how we do all of this stuff. Um, and I think I, I'm proud to say that if you were using some IPFS applications in those regions, they would work just fine because they weren't touching DNS at all. And so um, that's cool. Uh, what's happening to the internet right now is that we're, you know, if you think about packet switching to the ARPANET to the large internet ecosystem to then the web, what's happening is that all these applications are being built into this, this secure cryptographic um, mesh or chain. Like you can think of them as blockchains, but there's all, all, all their kinds of hash linking uh, that's not just one singular chain. And we're building them in such a way that they can be distributed around the world, and they don't have to be communicating to any kind of central mothership. And uh, we are going to turn these live web applications that today are like a service that you use into a tool that you download and then you run yourself. And you don't have to worry about people maintaining a service all the time. Um, there's major, there's, there's huge problems when you just rely on a service that other people run. And they can take that away at any moment, or your connection can be cut, or their business model might shift, or whatever. Um, and so I think these major applications that we as humans have come to depend on and imbue into our own self, like think about how much you do over the web and you rely on daily on the web, these applications need to become tools that you have control over, not services that you rely on other people to run for you. Um, so there's a ton of projects going on, and uh, I'm very happy that these days, like IPFS is and Ethereum, are, are, which you know, two and a half years ago didn't exist, um, I think I got the timeline right, uh, have become some of the major projects that are leading this charge. And uh, thinking about the web, like Web 1.0 was about linking content to each other. Web 2.0 was about imbuing, putting dynamic programs in the loop and getting humans to generate content and so on. And it seems that this Web 3.0 thing that we're, we're all working on is taking locations and organizations out of the equation, letting content link to itself, letting programs link to each other, letting all these transactions happen on their own, uh, where everything is publicly verifiable, um, the incentive structures are right, so that these systems can just treat computers as like these true commodities that can be run anywhere. Um, and the programs can uh, be certifiable not rely on specific organizations. So just removing people from the loop. One interesting fact, right? So today, and this is something we care a lot about, if you want to put some content, like some piece of data onto the web and make it stay there, like basically pay somebody to keep it there for you, you have to be a legal entity. You have to have the ability to sign legal documents. You have to be able to like use a credit card to sign up for a service and pay someone like Amazon to store your stuff for you. And this is ridiculous, right? Like, it, it's easy because a lot of us have that, and so like we check those boxes already. But think about a program being able to like store this, right? This is what's amazing about um, blockchain distributed systems. Um, we are completely overturning that and saying, no, 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 you can be a program with a wallet and money and just deploy it, and that's it. And so this is a, a very different way of thinking. Um, so I'll give a short overview of IPFS and how it works. Major problems in the web, huge inefficiencies, bad security model, links break, censorship, no offline use, definitely doesn't work on most emerging networks. And a lot of this stems from that location addressing, right? So you have domains pointing to IP addresses, and that means you, have, you can cut the connection at any point. Uh, I really like this analogy. It's kind of like saying, imagine that you couldn't address books by uh, any other way except their location. You couldn't use titles, you couldn't use authors, you couldn't use ISBNs. You had to tell someone, oh, this amazing book, you have to go read it. It's in the New York Public Library, section nine, bookcase three, top shelf, first from the left. Go there, check it out. And think about how much could go wrong in that equation, right? Like, you first of all have to get on a plane and go there, which is insane. Uh, you get there and maybe the library is closed or doesn't exist anymore, or someone checked out the book before you, or someone moved the book just a few places over and now you have a wrong book and you don't even know. Um, it's just <laughs> crazy, right? Like, and like the most infuriating one is like if you show up there, you find the book, and you're like, oh, great, I have this in my backpack. Awesome. Um, so this is totally wrong, right? And it seems that we lost something when we went from physical information stored in books and paper into digital information. 
when we built the web, we wanted to focus on the updatability and mutability of this, this information. And so we said, great, just talk to that server and figure out what it is. Uh, but we lost the ability to treat two physical copies of information as the same thing. Today, two physically independent copies of information on the web are not the same thing. And that's, we need to fix that. Uh, so, hey, hash links to the rescue, Merkle trees for the win. Um, you can bind names and, of course, maybe not use DNS, use some other naming system that's secure, uh, and um, use fingerprints of content to treat these things as the same thing. So you don't have to put locations or identities or organizations in the loop. Uh, and so that's the core idea of IPFS, that, that changing this addressing. And it turns out that it's a huge problem. You have to build tons of code and uh, change, create a new peer-to-peer -peer stack. And you know, it's the biggest yak shave in the world. Um, but uh, we are like you know, two years in, no sign of stopping. Uh, we're fixing a lot of things along the way. And it's great. And IPFS stands for Interplanetary File System So uh, for three reasons. And so one is an homage to Lake Flighter, who called the internet the intergalactic network. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is um, we think of this thing called the interplanetary principle, that if you design a system and you think about how it would work both in Earth and Mars, and you try to design it to work across planets with nice latency for humans, you're going to make something that actually works well across Earth in all its places. Because to a data center, being somewhere in an emerging network, um, it's pretty much as if you were in Mars, right? Like when you think about the latencies that a server deals with. So apply the interplanetary principle to so your system designs and say, would this work well in Mars? Like if you were trying to communicate from Earth to Mars? And like that helps. And the third thing is that we actually mean it. So we are designing IPFS such that when SpaceX and others get to Mars, the first pioneers that land uh, can use the internet and the applications that we use here seamlessly there locally and to communicate with us. Um, I'm proud to say that some, that IPFS would work just fine and orbit this peer-to-peer -peer chat app that I'll talk about in a bit um, works. So that's cool. It's a huge open source project. Lots of people contributed. In fact, many people here in the room um, I have the great pleasure to work with and have built major parts of the system. And so it's this amazing effort. Yeah, so this peer-to-peer -peer chat app. Uh, so I'm going to go through like some quick use cases. Uh, this is a way of building something like Slack or IRC, but completely distributed. So you don't have any central point of failure. You don't have even a blockchain to deal with, um, unless you want to do things like authentication and unless you want to do some things like know whose human readable name is, is um, you know, like if you want to do identity, then you have to deal with some sort of authority. Uh, but you can use Orbit in a totally distributed way and get the application loaded, run it, talk to each other, and not rely on anyone else. Uh, things like OpenBazaar are rebasing their architecture on top of IPFS. Uh, things like MediaChain, a lot of Ethereum applications. This is a great synergy between our, our systems. Tons of, of things use um, IPFS, uh, things like Uport. Uh, there's like social networks emerging now on blockchains and IPFS. Uh, things like crypto assets and so on. Uh, this is a really cool project. Uh, thanks to uh, the consensus folks to do it. Uh, apparently, a huge mining corporation, like real mining, like ground mining, is now using Ethereum and IPFS. So that's awesome, uh, straight up. People use IPFS to archive data. Um, it's bundled in the OSs of, of NASA's and so on. It's used in a bunch of systems, uh, developer tools, package managers, moving around any kind of static data and so on. Um, I mentioned a couple of projects that have spun out of IPFS. So one of them is libp 2 p It's a collection of peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Uh, this is similar, in, very much similar in spirit to dev P2P, and we're actually working a lot on integrating those two. Uh, this is a frustration that we all had of like, great, we want to make peer-to-peer -peer systems. Oh, we must first reinvent the entire network stack. Uh, let's not do that again. Let's, let's just do it once and make a project, uh, and that's it. I think we call multi-formats, which tries to encourage people to build systems that can evolve and interoperate with each other. Uh, when you make a bunch of assumptions about what hash functions or what crypto protocols you use or what network addresses and so on, you should encode that into the values that you pass around because otherwise you're going to have a really hard time trying to make these things talk to each other. Um, so that's one project. The most interesting one uh, of these to Ethereum is IPLD, which is a, this common hash chain format uh, for distributed data structures. So when you think about Ethereum, Git, Bitcoin, IPFS, BitTorrent, Plan9, uh, they all use hash chains, uh, but they, all use different, they use different formats. 
But what we'd really like is like some web that binds all these distributed authenticated data structures into one thing. Uh, so you can really have like a nice Merkle forest and you can like link between all these different Merkle trees natively and like traverse them. So that's what uh, IPLD is about. And happy to say that we almost, we uh, announced this recently and we almost have it working. Uh, people uh, both in the IPFS and Ethereum communities are working together on this. Uh, we will have the ability to look at all of the Ethereum blockchain and all of the content stored in Ethereum natively in IPFS because we can now link from IPFS content to uh, Ethereum and then from Ethereum to Bitcoin and Git and everything else. So that's uh, pretty cool. So, so at, uh, at DEF CON 2, we talked about uh, three things majorly. So we talked about Lip2P and we worked on putting uh, Ethereum on the browser with Dev P2P and Lip2P. That was an awesome uh, demo. We talked about Orbit, and I'll mention it later if there's time. And um, or I'll dive deep into how you actually structure something to be completely distributed and not rely on any central consensus. Um, and the third thing we talked about was Falcon. Uh, so what is Falcon? I think a lot of people here are probably wondering about that and want to hear me talk about that. So I'll say a bit. Uh, I do want to focus attention on looking at some other problems. Um, so I'll just kind of run through, think about Filecoin as Bitcoin or Ethereum meets Amazon S3 on top of I IPFS. Um, and uh, the major problem that Filecoin is built to solve is, let's think about the cloud um, business or like the cloud system of, of putting all this infrastructure out into the network, things like computing and storage and so on. And just, if you focus on storage, how could you create a free market so that everyone who's not like, you know, the top three can actually compete and can actually allocate resources and optimize the storage function, right? So if I want to, I want to store and serve something on the network, where should it go? Who should store it? How can I make sure that it's there over time? And how can I create the incentive structure to just encourage tons of people around the planet to add every single disk that's lying there um, disconnected to the network to create something um, like what the Bitcoin network has created, right? Like this insane hash rate increasing. Um, so a lot of people ask, like, how could you ever possibly think that uh, a decentralized or distributed network could ever compete with the huge tech titans, right? Like Amazon, Google, Microsoft. They could never, uh, a decentralized network could never compete with that, right? But, but think about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin started this way with a bunch of uh, little spare hardware cobbled together, and uh, now it's pretty professional. And I'm sure like the latest pictures look way cooler. Um, it's all over the world, and the hash rate is absolutely insane. Uh, this processing power, like it, it's wasting more energy than um, small nations. It's, uh, <laughs> I think somebody like calculated that it's, it's just using, the CPUs dedicated to this vastly exceed the, the CPU capacity of like the big titans, right? So it's not quite a fair comparison because the titans are not trying to focus on building as much CPU as possible, but it's still breathtaking that this is many factor, like it, I think it's potentially tens or hundreds of times larger than what the Titans have. So it implies like you can take um, a distributed network or decentralized network, encourage tons of people to add resources to the network and make it much larger by great factors than the clouds of today. Uh, so it's, I love seeing this, as much as I hate all this energy going to waste, and I love that today it's about proof of stake and like getting rid of this insane problem. I love the fact that uh, powerful monetary incentives can cause this kind of thing worldwide. So Falcon is about let's use let's create the kind of same incentive structure, but for adding storage to the network, create a cryptocurrency incentivized storage network. Looks pretty simple. Miners add disk to the network. They exchange, they sell that. They basically sell that storage to the network, uh, and they receive Falcon for doing so. They can then exchange that Falcon for Bitcoin, dollars, Ether, and so on. Um, I have many versions of these slides. One of them has Ether, one of them one has other, like Zcash, I think. Um, then the third thing is, like, of course, users can then buy Falcon and then spend it on the network to store stuff. And uh, it has three layers. So Falcon is a mined blockchain, so there are miners mining uh, this storage and getting, receiving a block reward. Then there is a data contract layer, which is where Ethereum and the connection makes perfect sense, which is we need a sophisticated way to express things like escrow and insurance and um, bonding for like long-term commitments on storage 
uh, time locks and so on, like very sophisticated ways of storing data that major organizations would never use a, a, a network without. It, like, some organizations require certain levels of insurance or certain kinds of storage um, constraints that you need contracts for, and this is where it's a perfect fit with what Ethereum has developed. And the last thing is the secondary market at the top, which is that once you have a huge network storing a bunch of data, you can then sell that data very quickly with payment channels um, without having to go on chain. And so you can have like some lightning fast uh, distribution of content uh, on, top of, on top of this. So the, at DEF CON, we announced that the Filecoin blockchain will be virtualized on top of Ethereum. What that means is there will be a, a blockchain, but it will be on top of of Ethereum, and it will connect directly to the Ethereum contracts that are out there. Ethereum contracts will be able to hire Falcon contracts, and there's a lot of work involved in making that work. Uh, we'll be releasing papers later on of like exactly detailing how, um, but that's a general uh, idea. To give you a sense of the magnitude of storage that we can summon, uh, uh, think about just even not that big of a network, right? 10,000 nodes is not huge. Uh, 100 terabytes is not out of the question. Uh, nowadays, we have one to 10 terabytes at home. Uh, at least in places like this. And so with that, when you multiply, you get an exabyte, and that's way more than all of Netflix and Spotify combined, and it's about on the order of what Facebook has, right? And like that's a relatively small network, right? So what happens when you have the insane incentive structure of Bitcoin power in this thing? Like, could we get tens, hundreds of exabytes, someone to the network? Could we encourage tons of people to just work extremely hard on like, um, on making more and more and more disks to just add more storage to the network because their block reward will like underwrite this whole um, this whole in, uh, process. And that's what uh, we're focused on. And uh, we, as mentioned earlier, we will be doing um, a so to when we launch Filecoin and release it to the to the whole network, we will be doing a Filecoin sale to release a lot of the coin into the hands of other people that can actually use it and run the network. So what's next, both for us and for the system as a whole? Um, a lot of amazing things are happening. You know, you have these totally distributed computation platforms emerging. Uh, you have smart contracts and, and lots of distributed applications and decentralized applications uh, changing entirely how people think about law and finance. You have prediction markets that are about to hit. Uh, that's going to be very interesting. You have free markets, you have you know, social networks that are starting to get built on this stuff. You have Zcash, right? So that I think is gonna be probably one of the most important developments in finance in a long time, which is what happens when you have totally private money that people can't look into. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's gonna be a very interesting next couple of years. You have things like Falcon and many others that are trying to turn the cloud into a free markets. And you have this amazing new way to fund protocol development. The reason this is important, this way of funding uh, is important, is that when you think about protocol development, uh, it's quite hard to capture value from creating a protocol and feed it back into the uh, development itself, right? So when you think about the web or the internet, think about how much value got created by things like TCP IP or HTTP, and think about all of that, um, and then say, okay, great, like how much money of all this value that got generated, how much of it got captured that we can feed back into the creation of the next generation of protocols? And the only route to do that was by creating applications that created some sort of value exchange, captured some value, and were able to um, then invest in certain areas of protocol development that benefited those applications and not the inherent protocols and not the inherent ideas of the internet themselves. So what, I and, and everyone at Protocol Labs finds extremely attractive about this new way of funding protocols is that we can stay as close to the protocol layer as we can um, and create a way for the protocol itself to, if it fulfills its mission of creating value, then capturing de facto some amount of that value to it reinvest it into the development of that network and other networks. Um, and this is, there's a lot going on right now around this, but I think people are missing like the biggest point here. Like this is a way to unlock major innovation and speed up the entire process. Um, I want to talk about other things here, which is the amount of internet users is actually quite small compared to the well, not quite small, but not everyone's on the internet yet, right? And so a lot of people who don't have access to the superpowers we do. And uh, the reason this is particularly frustrating is that the internet was brought in as this huge equalizing force that people would just be able to access all information and knowledge in the planet. 
and have equal access, basically. But that's not true. And the internet today benefits most those people that are closest to the backbone and those people that have you know, the newest devices and so on. And s simple bad habits of making websites big or relying too much on locations or, or having a bunch of round trips that are not painful when you're in Silicon Valley and your, your ping time is you know, one millisecond are excruciatingly problematic to people in the edges of the network and many times just completely block them from accessing entire systems. And so, great, we can work as hard as we can to drop, to like airdrop tons of uh, what, like laptops all over the world for children, but like, if they can't even access a website, like what is the point? Or like, if they, even if they can access the website, it's just insanely slow, right? Um, it's, it's, uh, this is a, a why we have to go not just decentralized, but completely distributed, so the content and the applications can get there and run there locally. The other thing here is, is mobile phones, right? So the majority of the planet is using mobile phones, not laptops, uh, not desktops. So for these new ways of building applications to change the world fully, um, we need to make this work with the low um, resource usage uh, requirements of mobile phones uh, with those kinds of networks and so on. Uh, I want to talk about CRDTs here because everyone loves consensus and it's like, we finally like made thing, you know, like the, the Byzantine generals problem interesting. We finally, or like, you know, in a mass popular way, we took it out of computer science and said, hey world, like this is actually a really cool problem. And when you can build blockchains, you can solve it in like this other new way um, and it has great properties. But this, there's another branch of thinking in the distributed systems world, which is think about building applications that are meant to converge, that over time they coalesce updates, and when you exchange information, you always arrive at the same thing, so that you don't have to think about consensus, so that you don't have to think about forcing the entire network to converge at one point and then you know, transact in that way. Um, remodeling a bunch of the applications that, that exist today in this domain, where you think about just computers everywhere and like exchanging updates is required to achieve the full distribution of, of the application platform. It's what's required to get to deliver things like Khan Academy to the children of the world that need it most. And it's what's required for moving our transaction processing systems that we're turning into blockchains today into something that, is, that works fully um, around the world. There's a lot of challenges here, but the problems are not impossible. There are already solutions in mind and we just have to implement them. So that's most of this, all the slides I had. Um, I'll just go back to probably like, which one's cool? This one, there we go. Most important one. Oh, I guess the recording stops, but that's fine. Um, the thing I wanted to kind of end with is um, some open problems that I see in the blockchain space and in distributed systems in general, uh, or not exactly open problems, but trying to add, um, fan the flames of some efforts that I think uh, are very important. So one of them is formal verification. So um, we saw over the last year what uh, the problems that can happen when you program things and you don't um, listen to people that audit your code or you um, don't formally verify it. And I think computer science has devoted hundreds, maybe thousands of hours into producing formal verification methods designed precisely to stop this problem. So we need to invest deeply in that and deploy it. And it's actually quite difficult to convince most developers around the world to say, hey, trade your like, nice dynamic languages into something that is very strongly typed and that is actually quite hard to compile. But if we can figure out how to solve that part of the pipeline, then we can lift formal verification and give it to everyone and have contracts that we can trust fully. The other part of formal verification is I would love to have a, you know, actual implementations of a lot of these core systems that are fully formally verified. The fact that you, we don't have that and we just keep changing them is, is in, they're all these moving targets, is kind of terrifying, right? Like, again, we saw what happened to DNS today, or like yesterday. Um, it, thankfully, like, um, a lot of systems are, have been around for a long time, they're well audited and we think they're fine, but a lot of the new stuff that we are making in this room over the last year and the last couple of years does not have that same level of security. Um, security guarantees. So it'd be really nice to, if we can formally verify critical components of these systems. Uh, another thing is um, I really like the effort in Ethereum to uh, put the EVM on top of um, WebAssembly. I think that's super critical because WebAssembly is the 
VM that's getting deployed into the entire um, uh, world, right? Like it's going into mobile phones, it's going into IoT, it's going into all that stuff. Uh, and by the way, now that uh, the Tesla guy is here, I just talked about formal verification and the importance. So thank you for doing the work you're doing with uh, formal verifying stuff. Yeah, talk to that guy. It's pretty cool. Uh, so the uh, thing with uh, WebAssembly is that if we focus on that as a target and we can build all these distributed systems in that way and we think about the web and executing code that you know, we can verify and check and write proofs for, and we can just move around code and execute it in various places, um, and we all converge on those kind of standards, then we can uh, deploy much faster. We don't have to change as much of the architecture, so that's um, a good, good thing. Already talking about distribution, full distribution and, and consensus, um, I think another thing there is namespaces. So a lot of people right now are thinking about how do you do namespaces that are human readable um, in a fully decentralized way, or ideally in a fully distributed way, which is inherently a whole different beast. Um, or can you do without human readable names, right? So one of the cool things about China is uh, they're really into QR codes, and uh, they don't actually type, write that many names, and they actually scan QR codes and use them. Something that in, in the US we're like, ah, pff, QR codes, what? Um, over there is actually the main way they, they um, you know, things like WeChat and so on, like you can use QR codes to communicate and to pass huge strings. And so if you can use hashes there, like you don't have to type or write a hash. One problem with QR codes is you can't really draw them, right? Like imagine if you, well, I want to give you an address and now I have to like write a hash or draw a QR code. But there might be something there. There might be some other way of communicating strings between humans in a way that's not relying on a central authority for allocating short strings of like human readable characters. Like that's, that problem is, is what caused the DNS outage yesterday, right? Like the fact that we humans aren't good at memorizing long strings of characters caused the major loss of value yesterday and causes all sorts of pain for developers and, and engineers everywhere. It's kind of crazy Like if we had evolved, if for whatever reason humans had evolved with a need to memorize long strings, um, the world would be very different. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm hoping that within 100 or, or 200, we, uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to interface with computers very directly, or um, other things will happen. So uh, yeah, I think those are things that people in this room are struggling with and finding solutions for. And we'll hear about later today a bunch of solutions around some of these things. We'll, we'll talk about proof of stake. We'll talk about um, consensus in a way that doesn't create this huge wastage of electricity. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, hopefully we'll get into scalability and, and moving um, the transaction limits into something where we can get achieve millions of transactions per second or billions of transactions per second. Because that's actually what's required for dealing with um, most of the transactions that happen on the internet. Most of the transactions on the internet are not financial money moving. Uh, they're actually somebody sending a message to somebody else on a social network or things like that, things of that ilk. And so that's actually a transaction. It's, it's some actor causing some state change to some other actor somewhere. And for these systems to replace the way we architect all these systems, we need to reach that level of scalability. It's exciting to see also like the lightning eyes here in the room. I think it's, it's a great collection. Um, so very excited for the rest of today. I think I'm just about out of time. I want to thank all of you for being here. It's great to see you. And it's great that Silicon Valley um, is paying more, much more attention to Ethereum this year. Uh, than the year before and, and the one before that. Uh, there was a, a huge barrier, I think, between uh, everyone really focused on Bitcoin and not really listening. And now there's a lot more listening and realizing that, whoa, like this amazing new platform emerged and is questioning a bunch of assumptions. Uh, so that's very cool. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so it's always nice to have a question or two Sure. How about a couple questions? Oh, of course. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Greg. Um, so I, I, I think that terminology uh, is, is a really important thing. Uh, so sometimes when I uh, hear you say uh, things like not decentralized but distributed, I kind of cringe inside uh, because the paper that that image comes from uh, it was from a guy who was writing for a company. I think it was like, might have been AT and T or Bell Labs or something like right. that. And that network that he called uh, fully distributed, or what, what you call fully distributed, uh, was 
in the way that we use the term decentralized today, was a centralized network because there was one company uh, that controlled that entire network. Uh, so, is do you do you see a way uh, for um, uh, the, the the people who are sort of you know advocating decentralized networks uh, and the people who are advocating distributed networks to be able to um, stop fighting with each other and come to a shared terminology that both sides can agree on? So um, my so my take on this is actually that decentralized and distributed are exactly synonyms. And um, I use the three words, uh, number one, politically decentralized, which means there's not one group that controls it. Number two, it's actually de decentralized, which means there's not one computer. So, and if one computer goes down, the thing still works. And number three, logically uh, uh, decentralized. So something that's logically centralized, for example, would be a Merkle tree, because even if there's thousands of nodes, nodes storing it, there's still one root, whereas all other structures are, might be logically decentralized. So there you go. But so yeah. what do you need to add? Yeah, I'll just say one more thing. Um, yeah, and that's kind of why I introduced a caveat of saying this is my terminology. Other people disagree with it, and that's fine. Um, I don't think people are fighting. I'm really pushing forward for decentralized networks. What I do want to draw, draw attention to is that everyone, even in this room, is saying, great, let's decentralize uh, computation and decentralize the web. And we're building blockchains, which of course are decentralized and decentralizing power, but are centralized in this very other different problem, which is you don't have this very nice fabric that you can cut. Um, and I'm directly making an appeal to the old definition of distributed, to the one that Paul Baran used, to the one that Vince Cerf used, uh, to think about something that you can really cut in half or in small pieces and still work. Um, and yeah, we can maybe find a better word for that. Um, there, so far, there isn't a very nice word that captures that other than distributed. Um, that's my take on it. Uh, we can disagree on terminology. OK, we're just going to get one more question here. Hi, uh, name's Sony. A quick question on Filecoin. I was wondering if there are, or what are your thoughts are in terms of either collaborating or merging parts of uh, Filecoin slash IPFS with Swarm, at least use maybe the incentivization that Swarm's working on with the storage or the content addressability that you guys have. In, in general, is there, how are you thinking about either bringing the two together? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, interesting collaborating. Uh, in fact, at DEF CON, we spent a bunch of hours sitting uh, together and talking about ways of bridging things. Um, I think one big, uh, one of the things I, I love about um, the Swarm work is a, a very strong focus on, on generating these kinds of contracts that have collateral and have insurance and so on. Um, I think there's a lot of possibilities for more collaboration, and we'll, we'll get into those in the future. Um, I think ultimately what we need is much more um, direct working together. I think part of the part of like the siloing of development that we're seeing in some some networks is just due to the fact that developers and humans can only interact with so many people in a day and can only interact with so many code bases in a day. And I think just spending more time together physically, like centralizing all of us for a bit uh, and working together on some pro on solving very accurate, concrete problems and deeper ways of integrating will help. So that's one of the one of the cool things about putting um, Filecoin on Ethereum is actually much more tighter integration with those kinds of contracts and those kinds of, of and, and that uh, development and energy. Okay, let's thank Juan. Thank you. <laughs>